Major support for Do The Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Edison International, Dolly Strong Credit Union, California Resources Corporation, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, Bakersfield City School District, and Kern High School District. With additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California. Well, good afternoon and welcome to Do The Math. I'm Michael. And I'm Scott. And in studio with us, we have Lauren. And Lauren, if somebody needed to contact us, what would they need to do? For math homework help, call 636-4357. Uh, Outside of Bakersfield, call 1-866-636-6284. If you want to email us, email do the math at kern.org. We're online also at do the math online.net. And you can find us on social media at Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. All right, nicely done. So Lauren, where do you attend school and what year are you in? I go to Stockdale High School and I'm a senior in high school. And you are a Mustang then, correct? Yes, I'm a because Mustang. Because yesterday we had a senior from South High School and I wasn't aware that they are no longer Rebels. That's they right. are Spartans now. Oh. Right. Did you know that? I did not know that, well, no. See, okay, well, good. I wasn't the only one that didn't know that then. And he said that he has all of that social media stuff do you do that stuff too? I only have Instagram and I use YouTube for like math help or homework help in general. Okay. And you know that do the math is on YouTube. Yes, so that's I probably do. where you get your I help do. sometimes, right? All right. So there you go. Nice plug for the show right there. <laughs> so anyway, what math course are you taking this year as your senior year? This year I'm in AP Stats and it's fun, but last year I took AP Calculus and I enjoyed that more. So you like calculus more than yes, stats? Yes, I did. For students that are a little bit younger, and you say AP, what does that mean? Because students might go, all right, well, you take algebra or calculus, I understand that, uh -huh. but what does AP mean for a younger student? AP is like a college course. You take a test at the end of the year to try and get college credits um, to hopefully get those to transfer to uh, colleges so that you can take less classes when you're in college. Right, you can take more electives or exactly. move on to higher level. Move it faster, yeah. Mathematics and exactly. things like that. So, do you remember all four courses of math you've taken in high school? Yes, I did geometry going into my freshman year, the summer before, and then my freshman year I took Algebra 2, Advanced Algebra 2, um, and that was GATE, so that was just a higher level, but it's not AP. And then I took um, Honors Math Analysis last year, and that's like the next level right before AP, which is like a challenging course, but you don't get college credit for it. Okay. Um, then last year I took AP Calculus BC, which is the faster paced version of calculus. And that one was AP and I took the AP test last year and I got a five. So hopefully that'll qualify. Yeah, and I then, think it should because I think it's four and up, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I think it's three and up, but for okay. the higher level schools it's four and up. Right, okay, that's why I was thinking four. Yeah, and then this year I'm taking AP stats and I do plan on taking the test as well. Good, well you must have had some excellent teachers when you were in some younger grades that pushed you and <laughs> made you do some hard work and made it a little bit easier when you got into high school as I it is happening did. right now. There you go, that a girl. <laughs> anyway, uh, is there any one of the courses that you've taken that you enjoyed, I know you said you like calculus mm -hmm. more than stats, but of your previous classes, did you like any of those more than calculus? I definitely, calculus is definitely my favorite class. I enjoyed the teacher, she was sarcastic, which is my favorite type of humor, <laughs> and she was just, she was just an overall great teacher. I really understood it. And I think that's a big part of enjoying your mathematics, mm -hmm. is how it's being presented to you and your experiences with it yeah. in, a in a particular class 
and the freedom to know that it's all right to make mistakes exactly. and to experiment with different methods and things like that and know that it's fine and it's actually important to mm -hmm. struggle with it a little bit yes. in order to grow and develop a, a, a better understanding of the mathematics. Yeah, I'm in computer science this year and that's mainly her goal for us is to struggle with it and learn how to do it because every time you click run the code, um, it gives you an error and it's so frustrating, but when you finally get it, it's so rewarding. And therefore you learn from that. Yes. All right. <laughs> well, thanks for coming down and joining us this afternoon. I'm excited. Good. Well, we're going to get you to work in a little bit, young lady. But first, we're going to take a look at today's Math in the News. All right, big news today uh, hitting Florida, Hurricane Ian, I believe it's Ian today hitting uh, Florida. Heard about it for the last few days, everybody's known that this is going to be coming, so one of the things that you hope that people are doing is getting prepared for things like this, and especially people along the Gulf where this is hurricane season, you know what's coming and hopefully you kind of escape it a little bit and not get the brunt force of it. and massive destruction, but I figured let's take a look at how they rate hurricanes based on wind speed. So a tropical depression is the mildest, so the wind speeds are less than 38 miles per hour. Then you have a tropical storm, they pick up a little bit, then you get into the categories and they go one through five. And if I'm not mistaken, I think this is a five that is four. rolling through there right four, now. Right. Four or five, that's what I've heard. Uh, so you can see how the wind speeds increase right there. And it's about every 20, 30 miles per hour where it goes up a category. So that's just looking at it numerically. Some students need a picture to understand it a little bit more. So I figured let's take a look at uh, some pictures of this also. So this is also talking about the storm surge and how high the waves are going to be. So we can see the different categories and the wind speeds are still the same up here. But now you can see how high the surge is going to be as well. So four to five feet, right, you've got a storm surge of four to five feet where this is just a category one. That is covering us as right. this is coming over, right. right? You don't want water and waves coming up as high as you are, <laughs> right? You're getting things right now that are down, and I've heard them say over 20 feet, that they're like 25 feet some of these surges are. That is way over this category five over 18 feet. And that is, that is engulfing your entire house and I was watching some footage earlier and they have fire stations where they're trying to just get the fire trucks and fire engines out and they're already in waist deep water so they can't go out to help people until they can first themselves get ready right. get situated mm -hmm. in order to go out but they're already dealing with water levels that high before it even hits mm -hmm. so that's another photo, a uh, little something that you can see if it makes a little more sense on how this progresses as it goes from category one through five. And we can see a pattern in there. Mm -hmm. And that's all mathematics is basically, is a bunch of patterns. Yeah. So I figured let's take a look at some patterns in nature. So have you ever had to do any of this kind of look the at patterns? Fibonacci sequence. Yeah, the Fibonacci yeah. sequence, perfect one right there. Uh, so we can see different things. These are things naturally occurring. Uh, that show patterns in nature. And I figure, all right, well, let's get down to the numbers part of this, <laughs> right? And we can see triangular numbers. And these I just thought were kind of cool. Uh, where if you take one times nine plus two, and then add the two times nine, add another one to what you're adding, right? And you will continually just keep on adding ones. You like that? Yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. slick, isn't it? Yeah. That's what I said too. I was like, you know, it's pretty cool, right? <laughs> and then when you do this over here, right, you're increasing the numbers. You just keep on adding another digit times eight, and the same thing, just keep adding another one, and you have this pattern here as well. So patterns, if you can understand patterns and how they work, that is going to help a lot in mathematics, and that is today's Math in the News. 636-4357 is the phone number. We do have phone tutors most Tuesdays and Wednesdays throughout the regular school year. If you phone in today and we do one of your math problems on air, you will win yourself a ticket to the Kern County Fair. Also, coming up, ah, there we go. <laughs> and a little piggy running across right there. You gotta love the cows and sheep, all the animals out there. That's a big part of the fair. Uh, FFA out there, I know that uh, 
the guys here at Do The Math that work for the Kern County Superintendent of Schools Office, they went out and did some features on those animals and the students that work with them. And uh, that will be shown on various venues and different things throughout mm -hmm. the season and stuff like that. But anyway, I'm not exactly sure when it's going to be shown or where, but I promise you it will be shown. <laughs> uh, but the fair is always a lot of fun. And we always know it's hot at some point That's during right. the fair, as it is this week, but it'll be cooling down. But the fair does end on Sunday. And starting next week, out at Calm, they have a brand new feature this year called Autumn Nights. And this is similar to Holiday Lights at Calm, where in the past, people that might remember walking through Calm during Holiday Lights, and now it's a drive-through. But they wanted to get back where people could go on a walk through the grounds at Calm experience the animals and enjoy lights mm -hmm. so they're doing autumn lights mm -hmm. at com now and that will be happening in october and starting next week we'll be giving away passes to go to that event as well so you can see the uh, graphic for that right there that will be happening at california living museum once again we do have phone tutors available until 5:30 most tuesdays and wednesdays Lauren, a senior at Stockdale High School, is in studio with us right now working on statistics. We're going to have you working in a little bit. But first, Do The Math always has opportunities to go out to different businesses and industries throughout Kern County. And right now, we're going to visit the Kern County Forensics Lab. Today we are at Kern Regional Crime Laboratory and I'm with Kelly Woolery. How are you doing today? Good, thank you. And can you kind of tell us where we're at? Right now we are in the uh, Firearms and Toolmark Unit Laboratory. And can you kind of give us a little background about yourself? Yes, uh, well I have a, a science degree and uh, that's how I was able to uh, be hired as a criminalist at the laboratory. When I was transferred into the Firearms and Toolmarks Unit, I had specialized training that was specific for a firearms examiner. We had to learn about ammunition components that had been fired through a firearm, bullets and cartridge cases on a comparison scope. Our training is an ongoing process, so we are continuously training and going to classes, seminars. So when you receive evidence here into the laboratory, can you walk us through the process? Yes, so that all evidence comes through our evidence control unit and that gets logged into the laboratory. It's given a specific laboratory case number and then we pick those items up that need to be examined in the firearms unit. We bring those back here into the laboratory where we conduct our examinations and comparisons. And so you kind of conduct those in a room over here, right? Uh, yes. Okay, can you kind of walk us over there? Um, I know that you have some things up on the computer that you're gonna show us. Yeah, so once I've already gone through the process of looking at the evidence items that have been received at um, my workstation with a lower power microscope. I then come here to um, run some samples through our database to conduct a search. So you've taken obviously photographs of the evidence? Yes, the, okay. yes. Okay, so kind of walk us through what you have here on the screen. So this is our database station workstation. Uh, it's called EvoFinder. At this station, we take cartridge cases or bullets that have been fired from a firearm, uh, whether it's the evidence at the scene that was collected at a crime scene or from test fires that we've generated from a firearm that law enforcement has submitted to us. We place the, the ammunition here, we place it inside, and this will scan the evidence item and it'll generate an image and we will look for possible links or matches that we then can give to our agencies, we generate a report, a possible investigative lead. So these are two different pictures? These are two yeah. different, yes. And I can show you a little bit so I can move these around. How do you know that they line up? What specific traits are there that tells you that these are the similar? Well, uh, that's a really good question. So I'm gonna move these apart because it really looked like one uh, one cartridge case. So these are actually two individual evidence items. And what I was lining up here, these are called the aperture shear 
And the aperture inside of a firearm uh, is actually where a cartridge case will sit against. It's the opening that the firing pin travels through to strike the primer. Inside the primer, there's material that provides the initial spark, and that is the gunpowder or the propellant, and then that is what expels the bullet through the barrel and out of the firearm. This is the firing pin impression. So both of these firing pin impressions are the same. Not all, fi not all firearms have the same shape firing pin impression. Uh, this, this shape of this aperture shear or the opening has imparted a mark onto the cartridge case. And that's what happens because of the high pressures inside of the firearm and the movement of the cartridge case. So these can be, these can be very unique marks. So there's also uh, marks here, uh, you can look on here. That is from the breech bolt where the cartridge case was sitting against and made contact with. And so we can see, I can see those marks here and I can see those marks here. And you can see that those line up as well. So there's a lot of areas that are lining up. These are called striations or marks or impressions with the firing pin. Uh, that are all very similar be between these two different pieces of two different evidence items from two different cases. And I'll show you again the aperture shear marks right here, this area here, though there's a lot of areas that are lining up uh, and that are very similar. So each kind of um, firearm has a different signature like inside of it. Yes, it can, but not all firearms are going to impart uh, markings not all firearms impart really good markings. Uh, some are better than others. And sometimes it might have to do with what the metal composition of the cartridge case is. Uh, it, it just depends so of a firearm. We're gonna kind of look closer at this underneath the microscope in a second. Yes. Because that's the next process, correct? Once yes. you've done this and you were working over there. Okay, so when we come back, we're gonna be looking a little bit closer underneath the microscope at the casings. All right, thanks for that, Mary Lou. Thanks to everybody at the Kern County Forensics Lab, including Allison Kennedy, who is our guest over there and uh, been a partner of Do the Math for many, many years. So thank you to everybody at the Forensics Lab. In studio, we have Lauren, a senior at Stockdale High School, loves calculus, but is taking statistics right now. So we're <laughs> going to work on one of those math problems. So you guys head over to the board. We'll take a look at the problem on the board right now. And uh, those at home that are familiar with this type of math can start looking at it themselves. And as you're going through this, Lauren, I would like you to explain to Scott, because we can see some of the work that you've done already. Mm -hmm. And we see that you have an answer. And you said you have the correct answer. Yes. But how you got there is a little confusing. Yeah. So maybe talking through it with Scott and maybe getting a different perspective on it, hopefully will make it a little more clear for you. Definitely. All right. So here we go. Let's take a look at it. The average yearly snowfall in a very nicely named town, Chileville, <laughs> is normally, okay, and there's a reason that's capitalized mm -hmm. for students that are like, well, why is that capitalized? Well, because there's different types. So normally distributed with a mean of 55 inches. If the snowfall exceeds 60 inches in 15% of the years, what is the standard deviation? And they give you some options down there, but we already know the answer is 4.83. So how do we get to that point? Okay, so <laughs> so <laughs> um, the normal distribution is important because then we can use z scores and mean equals zero and standard deviation equal one to solve a problem. But from there, where do we start? Yeah, where do we start? We have a lot of numbers that are going on there, and one of the words that students might recognize in that problem was the word mean, mm -hmm. right? That yeah. was probably a pretty important word. Yes. Right. So we had that word mean, and what was the mean? the mean fall, the mean uh, rainfall in that problem? A 55 inches, I think. Right, is that, is that what that said? Yes, 55. 55 inches, and again, that's the mean, and we want to just at least start with something that you know what it is, or at least you recognize, yes. right? So that's gonna be an important number. What else stood out to you when you first read the problem and things that you're picking up on? Uh, the 15%, 15% uh, uh, of the years was above 60 inches. Right. Okay, so the 15% of the years, it was higher, right? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and then there was one final piece of information there kind of near to the end, um, right? Do we have that problem again? What did it say at the very end there? 
What is the standard deviation? Yeah. Oh, sorry, maybe it was a little bit before. Oh, it's 60 inches? Yeah, 60 inches go. and 15%, yeah. right? Yeah, so 60. So usually it's a little bit higher, right? Mm -hmm. The mean is 55, but it's 60 inches. So it's up about five inches in 15% of the years, not all the years. Yeah. Okay, where do you want to go with this? Because when, when younger students look at a problem, they're, they're looking to get the right answer. And, and we're doing this a little bit differently. You have the right answer. Yes. You know what's going on there. Yes. But you know that the question on the test is going to be similar. Yes, I do. But it's not going to be this qu this question. No, obviously not. So if you can figure out the process, right, then and I know how the process it. works, you can apply it to a new, a mm -hmm. new problem. So what is the process here? What are we looking for? We're looking for the, the standard deviation. Standard right? deviation, gotcha. yeah. Gotcha. And you started off by saying something about the standard deviation is one. What does that mean? Um, well, when you have a normal distribution, you can draw out a curve like this, which means all the data fits into this one curve. Gotcha. And that means your mean is zero and all your standard deviations are one, two, and three, and then negative one, negative two, and negative three. Gotcha. So that would be your normal distribution, but now we have to apply it with this problem. Right. So when you look at, it, at the zero, right, the one, the, the piece of information that has the most occurrences, is that what the mean is? Is that where that falls? Right. The right mean is you average all of them. You add all gotcha. of the values and you divide by how many there are. And so when you say all the data can fall underneath this curve, what that means is every year that it's ever been recorded about how much rainfall happened in, sorry, snowfall in Chileville, right? <laughs> every year the amount of snowfall um, can be recorded in this graph. Fits in this graph. Some yeah. years it was really low, yeah. some years it was really high, but most of the years it was probably pretty close to the middle, yeah. probably pretty close to the mean, right? Exactly, okay. yeah. So at least we know what it's talking about. Yes. <laughs> okay. So tell me a little bit more about standard deviation. So I know that our Z score is important because we can take our X value, which would be 60 inches in this point, and our mean, and then we divide by our standard deviation. And so we have all three of these values, but now we just need to solve for the standard deviation. Okay, and so for people who like me who haven't done this in a while, tell me what these things mean. You said the X value is what? So the X value is the actual value you're uh, working with, which would be 60 inches. Okay, so you the said mean actual value, mm -hmm. and that makes sense to me because 55 is not the actual value, it's the average of a bunch of different values. Yes. But this value here is actually what comes from the problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you said that, the, is that a big M? Uh, no, this is uh, mu. Oh, gotcha. Okay, so mu, right? I'm not very good at drawing that either, but anyway, <laughs> well, take, take my word for it. That's what it means. Yes. And what is that number? That is always the mean. Okay, so that's where, so that's where 55 comes in. Okay, yes. and then on the bottom, again, you said standard deviation? Yes. Okay, and then what does that mean? Uh, that's sigma, and that's how far each value lies away from the mean. So this is one standard deviation away from the mean of zero in this normal distribution. This is two standard deviation, that's three standard deviations. And if you had to put that in regular, everyday terms, what does a standard deviation mean? Like, it, are, are these, I'm just looking at it like, how can I explain this to someone who has no clue what you're talking about? Or, how can I explain it as maybe a not math person? Are these equal amounts of? Yes, it's like how big is your step when you're walking? That's how big you're moving each time. Gotcha. And so we know on a graph, when you label a regular graph, right? Mm -hmm. You can't just go one, seven, 423, right? <laughs> yes. Because they have different values. Exactly, there, yes. And you're cutting off a huge chunk of the graph. You have to go one, two, three, or mm -hmm. two, four, six, or 10, 20, 30. Yeah. These have to be equal distances. Is that kind of what you're saying here? Exactly, yes. Okay. Gotcha. So at least we know what that means, too. Exactly. And that standard, standard deviation is? We don't know. That's what we're trying to figure uh, out. That's what we're trying to figure out. So this is one deviation. We just don't know what it is. Exactly. This is another deviation. We just mm -hmm. don't know what it is, and we have to find that out. Yes. Okay, where's that process? You're going to use this formula that you have. So oh, the other one that we didn't, didn't uh, identify here is Z. What does Z, that mean? Z. That's what we're going to solve here by rewriting the graph in a way that will be helpful to us. So okay. if we redraw the graph... And I always think pictures are helpful for me. Absolutely. I always say draw pictures as well. Whether we're doing algebra or geometry or whatever it is, if you can draw a picture of it, not only do you have the words, which mm -hmm. aren't going to go away, but you have a picture, you can visualize it. Yep, yeah. Go for it. So then we have 60 inches somewhere over here because we know it's greater than 55. We don't know how many steps are in between. Right. But we do know that this area is 0.15 because it's 15%. Ah, oh, right. So we know that the rest of this is 0.85 because altogether it's 100%. Sure. We said it so that would be everything else. So everything exactly. else up to the 
the middle and everything else over there. Yes, right. exactly. So now that we know um, this area, we can use something called inverse normal, and it's a command on a calculator. Oh, we love those calculators, especially yes. the further along we go in math. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so for the inverse normal, you, you put the area to the left of the, where you're trying to figure out, that's the value. You put your mean and you put your standard deviation. But again, we run into the problem that we don't have standard deviation. Right. So we have to use this other command called normal CDF. I don't know what CDF stands for, but my <laughs> stats teacher just told me it's normal CDF. Okay. You need the lower bound. I'm just going to take this. Oh, that was my example, yeah. Gone. <laughs> Upper bound. Okay. Mu and standard deviation. Okay. And that's where I fall into my problem because I need standard deviation for both of those. Right. But then I remembered it's normal distribution. It is normal distribution. So, and that's what the capital N was important exactly. for. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So this is always going to be zero like we just uh, outlined in our drawing. Okay. This is going to be one uh -huh. because standard deviation is always one. We do have our lower bound, which could be negative infinity uh, to 60, or you can do this area, but I would recommend negative infinity. Okay. So we have negative infinity to 60, oh, 60, and then zero and one. Then we would use our calculator. And when you put those numbers in, the calculator is doing some yeah. calculations for you that would take a little while on our part. You could do it by hand if someone yes. paid you enough, right? Yes. But we'd rather not. Thank we you, started, Texas Instruments. We started this week, uh, I just learned this this week, um, by we had a huge table called Table A, and it had uh, all the values, and you had to find each of these points and like see where they all intersected. Sure. But then we just And the learned, place where students are going to see that earlier than statistics is when they do sine, cosine, tangent, when yes. they do some trig functions. Mm -hmm. There's always a trig uh, table in the back of a geometry book. Yes. And you can look those values up, and then once you realize the calculator does it for you, you usually stick to that. Exactly. But it is possible to look up. Yes. So then, do you want me to explain how to do it on the calculator? No, I don't think so. Okay. But just go ahead and plug those numbers yeah, in. I was going to so say, just go ahead number. and do it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> knowing, that, knowing that we don't necessarily have to understand what's going on behind the scenes, but we do know that it's a lot faster to do um, on the calculator. With the calculator, sure. Yes, and so when you do this, you run into the problem of one that I did earlier, and then my stats teacher told me you have to use this one. Ah, okay. So you would use the same zero and one value. That's kind of nice. Yes, and then you know the area like we were talking about. But the important things to remember is area is to the left of the line. Right. It's always to the left, Not so right. you would have to Le use correct. point eight five. <laughs> <Okay>. Yes. <laughs> correct. So then you do the same. Uh, you do inverse normal on your calculator, you put your area as 0.85, and then 0, 1 are, are automatically in there, and you paste, and so I get that this value um, in Z terms, my Z value, when I'm just using 0 and 1, uh -huh. is 1.036. So now I can use this equation to help solve for standard deviation. Gotcha. So the Z value, 1.036, and that is each step is 1.036? No. The standard deviation is the length of the step. Z value is just where it is. So if we did a small graph like this, uh -huh. and here's my mean, here's 1, so my value is like here, oh, 1.036. Gotcha. Okay. So now we can finally solve, because we have all our values except for 1. So as long as we have all the values except for uh, 1, so we can So we're back solve. to this equation here. Yes. And the one we were missing was the Z. Z. So now we, we didn't have, have it. We have that now. OK, I got gotcha. you. So then our x value is our actual value. Yeah, so there's a 60. 60 Good. Minus uh, mu, which is, mu 55, is 55, which is our mean. And we still don't know. We still don't know standard deviation, which is what, what we're, we're solving for. for. All right. But at least if we have 3 out of 4, we know algebraically we can figure it out. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Hooray for inverse normal. Thank you for your help. Yay. OK, so doing simple algebra, you do 1.036 times sigma equals 5. We're going to go, yeah, go ahead and subtract that out. So you just multiply times sigma on both sides, right? Yes. OK, just so the algebra folks in the house can follow <laughs> along and feel like it's still part of uh, statistics. <laughs> and then in the end, you get your value is? 4.826 because I divided by 1.036 on each right. side. 
Right. Now, wouldn't it be nice if that number was one of the answers? Yes, it would. Yeah. Does it happen to be one of the answers? It does. <laughs> because nice. what they did is they just rounded it, so it's 4.83. Yes. Right. Four and five. even if it, if you were like, all right, I know I'm kind of close. When you divide those, you know it's going to be a little bit over because you're going five divided by a little more than one. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a little bit, more you know it's going to be a little more than four. Yeah. Right. So, and some of those mathematical things that we talk to students all the time about are, does the answer make sense? Exactly. And yeah. that exact strategy was wonderful. We're dividing five by a number that's a little bit more than one, mm -hmm. right? If you divide it five by one, you get five. Yes. But if you divide it by a number that's a little, a little bit more, more, you should get four and pieces. some change, yeah. right? And we're dealing with real world numbers here, so they're really not going to come out very nicely very often, right? Mm -hmm. They're not going to come Correct. out very evenly. Yes. Oh, we would love to have 1.2 <laughs> and we'll be yes. all finished and everyone lives happily ever after. Well, that doesn't happen in the real world very often. We have these numbers that are real world data and the numbers might end up being a super long decimal, but we can round them off. Mm -hmm. um, without actually doing it, is there a way you can check to make sure this answer is actually correct? What would, you, what would be the process mm. by saying, okay, this answer makes sense from the math, yeah. but how do we know it actually is the correct answer if you didn't have an answer key with you? Uh, well, you could plug it back into this equation mm -hmm. and pretend like you didn't have Z and solve go. it there and hope you get 1.036. <laughs> sure, yeah, you can always do something like that where you have four variables. Mm -hmm. You can put that one back in and take and another take one away another and see one. if you come back with it. Yeah, it's yeah. a good way to start, start to do it. And the way that you went about solving this problem, again, the object is to figure out what is the problem solving process mm -hmm. and focus on the process and not the answer. So if you got the wrong answer this time, because you made a silly calculation mistake, but you got the process, that's it's very the likely, important part, yeah. yeah. It's very likely that when you get to the test and get to actually solve a problem like this, the process will be correct and hopefully the calculations will yes. take. Yes. Yeah, great job. And that like is the that. important part is the process, right. how you're doing it. Yeah. Also, when you guys were discussing, is there a table to look at? And that's fine. And you can use the calculator if you understand how the table works. Right. Mm -hmm. That's right. the whole key. Yeah. yeah. All right. Nicely done. So, Lauren, do you ever get hungry working on math a lot? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, I know, you know, we do. But for your great effort so far this afternoon, you've got yourself a meal courtesy of our friends at Grillenburger. So, congratulations on that. Hopefully, you have an opportunity to go down and see Lydia. Let her know you're on the show. She'll want to hear all about it. And then uh, you'll be able to get yourself a meal. So, <laughs> yeah. hopefully, you'll have an opportunity to do that. We do have phone tutors available until 5.30 most Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Right now we do have another opportunity to check in with Mary Lou and the folks at the Kern County Forensics Lab. We are back at the Kern Regional Crime Laboratory and I'm with Kelly Willard. And Kelly, we had just talked about when you gather the evidence, um, you actually physically look at it and then we took it over to the computer where you scanned it and, and tried to find matches. Now we're again physically looking closer at the evidence. Yes, so if you see here I have, uh, this is a, a high power comparison microscope. I have the actual cartridge cases mounted one on each side and these are joined by an optical bridge up here and when I look through here it looks as though those two are side by side. So I look through here and I can adjust uh, the magnification here if I need to. I can find adjust uh, so things look clear to me. And then I have over here on, this t on the screen, the computer screen, I, I can see the images as well. And so this is what it looks like when I'm looking at this uh, under the microscope, as though they're side by side. So I can maneuver these around. So we can see here that these two are, and I can adjust the lighting if I need to. This is a little bit bright on that side. So my wonder, Kelly, is that has one been fired and one has not? No, these have both been fired. Yeah. These, yeah, these are both fired pieces of evidence. And so we talked a little bit earlier about sometimes things mark better when they've been fired. That's a really good example here. On this, the right side, this one has a lot more markings from the firearm. This one only has a few as far as right here on the breech. But there are lots of areas that the firearm um, can mark a cartridge case so this is just the head of the cartridge case. I can actually look on the side of the cartridge cases for chamber marks that may have been imparted uh, from being inside of the chamber. So right now we're just looking at the firing pin impressions and these markings here from the aperture and the breech. Uh, but even though on the left side there's not a whole lot of markings, you can see that if I move these together, what is there is actually still lines up. 
uh, even though it's not a whole lot for the left side. Now, were both of these cartridge cases evidence at the scene? Actually, these are different. So these are, these are test fires from a firearm that was received at the laboratory. We also compare the test fires to each other prior to comparing to the evidence items because we want to see if the firearm reproduces marks, what types of marks they're reproducing. Uh, if we can't identify those to each other, then we cannot make an ID to an evidence item. So you've also received the firearm in addition to this evidence as well? Yes, this one had a, a firearm that came into the laboratory. Okay. So these are called individual marks. These are like the unique microscopic marks that can be imparted to a cartridge case uh, from firing. But a lot of times we could rule things out based on the class characteristics. And the shape of the firing pin here, you can see it's kind of like a little half circle. We call that hemispherical. That is a class characteristic of the firearm. And that was, that was determined by the manufacturer prior to manufacturing the firearm. So everything that was manufactured to those specifications would have the same shape firing pin impression. So if there was a, a firing pin that was a different, let's say it was rectangular shape, that is something that I could easily rule out before even coming, we wouldn't even come to a microscopic comparison because those would be different class characteristics. Or for instance, if they were not the same caliber of firearm, then those are automatically ruled out. So we wouldn't even be here at this part uh, because those class characteristics would have, that would have been an elimination. Can you give us an example of what that would look like? Yes. Uh, so this one here, this is an example of, well, first of all, these are two different calibers. The one on the left is a nine millimeter. The one on the, the right is a 380 auto. There are instances where sometimes people do test, shoot the wrong ammunition in a, in a, in a firearm. These are two examples of something that could have happened, uh, even though you're not supposed to. But we can see here that even though, so their firing pins both have a similar shape, they're both the hemispherical, uh, there's some, a lot of differences uh, on this breech area and the app, with the aperture shear here too. This almost looks like we've got some curvature to the marks here, some kind of circular. So these are very different in appearance. It's, you don't have the striated marks, the linear marks that you have on the right side. I'm gonna kind of turn this around here, flip it around. Looks like a little bit, see a little bit of the aperture there. Uh, it's not a whole lot, but again, got kind of have these circular marks a little bit going on here that are, that are very different than the linear marks. So there is just so much more involved here, but we're gonna send it back to you, Mike, at the studio. When we come back, we have so much more to look at always a whole lot more to look at the Kern County Forensics Lab and the stuff that they do over there and what they find out and how they go about it is simply amazing. And I think if we could, I would like to send somebody over there every single month to do something different. That's just how much there is over there. And we thank them once again for their time because they are very busy and they, you know, oh, you guys want to come over and talk to us and film us and do stuff while we're in the middle of doing everything, but we certainly do appreciate that. In studio with us, we have Lauren, a senior at Stockdale High School, loving her statistics class right now. And hopefully after that last problem, uh, making a little more sense after talking it through, mm -hmm. seeing it presented maybe a little bit differently, talking it out a different way and things like that. Yeah. So as a senior, you have had a lot of different math courses, actually mm -hmm. more math courses than some students might take mm -hmm. because you took some advanced classes before, before you got into high school. Exactly, yeah. So have you always been interested and loving to do math? Um, that's actually a funny story because in second grade, I despised math. It was my least favorite why? subject. It just didn't make sense. It was like, why do I need to learn how to do this? I will never use it in life, which is totally not true. <laughs> um, Especially second grade. <laughs> exactly, yes. Um, so I had this teacher named Miss Van Catteram. And she just gave me math like all now, the time. Now you didn't have to throw the name out there, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. let's keep on going. <laughs> um, she gave me math all the time, every day, and it drove me crazy. But by the end of the year, I loved math. I don't know when it clicked, I'm not exactly sure, but I have loved math ever since. Good, so that's what it is. 
And that's what we were talking about earlier, struggling. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. If everything is easy, you're never going to learn. Exactly. Right? So you yeah. need to struggle. And a lot of kids, just like you said, I hated it, I despised it, I didn't yes. want to do it. But once you stick through it, Mm -hmm. you'll see the advantages of doing that. Yeah. Even now, like, I still don't like it. Like, last year in my AP Calculus class, she'd give us these hard worksheets. And I'm like, I don't know how to do this. You didn't teach me how to do this. Why do I need to do this? But in the end, it made sense why I needed to do it because I remembered it more because I was like, oh, finally got through the dumb problem. <laughs> And you're moving on to university to become a math major, correct? Yes. <laughs> That's funny that you say that, right? So where do you plan on attending or what schools have you applied to and heard back or anything yet from? I am currently in the middle of applying. I'm, I'm in the middle. I'm not starting, but I'm not near the end. Okay. Um, I'm applying to USC, Cal Poly Slow, and UCLA to name a few. Those, okay. would, be, those would be my top choices. And those are those. top schools in California, yes. which are relatively close to where you yes, live now. They so are, you yeah. can get back and forth to home a little bit. Exactly. Uh, prestigious schools, uh, you will learn a lot of math, you will do a lot of math. Yes. There. <laughs> so are there any schools outside of the state that, you have, you look, uh, that you've looked at? I am looking at Purdue as a real option, which is in Indiana. Um, because my grandpa actually went there, which is why I st first started considering it. And okay. I'm in marching band, and so I love marching band, and I've loved football ever since I was in <laughs> high school and got to watch all the football games. And I want to keep going with that at my college. Well, I'm excited that you're in marching band. Uh, uh, our children were also, and they loved it, and it's a great experience. Yes. Um, <laughs> You know, to do something outside of just going to school, being involved in school means doing mm -hmm. other activities and clubs and things like that. Yes. And are you aware that when you do marching band, if you do it in Indiana, it's going to be a little colder than when yes. you're in Southern California, right? <laughs> My parents have made sure I understand that it's going to be much colder because even when it's 50 degrees here, I've got like two sweatshirts on. And <laughs> oh, you're just going to love it in Indiana <laughs> in the wintertime then. Uh, but anyway, we wish you all the best with wherever you Thank do end you. up. And I know that... I, you were a student of mine back in sixth grade. Yes. And we reconnected and you were like, hey, what's going on? And I was like, come on the show and let's find out what's going on and what yeah. math you're doing and stuff. So if you wouldn't mind, when you do move on, you're always welcome back again. Got it. So the old man, I'll be here for a few more years. So <laughs> the four years you're in school, you'll probably have an opportunity to come back. We can visit again because we Perfect. have had people where I've had former students and some have gone to Stanford, if I'm not mistaken, John. Uh, they've come back to visit from me having them many years ago, and yeah. we hear about their experiences and what they're doing now. So we certainly would welcome you back again. Perfect. But you're not Yay. done working today, you ready? <laughs> yes, I am All ready. All right, head on over to the board. We're gonna look at this problem together, and uh, we're gonna move you on from stats right now. Sounds good. <laughs> so here's a different type of problem. So you have large squares and small squares and rectangles. So if you wanna put it, maybe draw a large square, and then a small square of fourth of the size, and a rectangle, and I, I put numbers on them just to make a reference. So I just said, let's make the small one one by one, and if the small one is one by one, the large one is two by two, okay. and the rectangle would be a one by two, just sure. so that we can put numbers on them. Okay. We could have put whatever we wanted on them, but the lower the numbers, the easier it's going to be. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have to use six large squares. Okay. You must use four small squares. Okay and then any number of rectangles that you want to use. But when you use all of these shapes, you have to make a new rectangular configuration. Wow. Okay. Okay. So just make any kind of rectangular configuration you would like to now using six large, four small, and however many rectangles you need. Six of these, four of these, and, and how many? However many of those oh, okay. you want to use. Gotcha. Okay. That's a question mark. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. All right, what do you think? I have Should no idea. Should we just start idea. drawing? Yeah, I guess okay. so. All right, give it a shot. Um, start drawing out some, some squares. So you need six of the big ones. We can use some of them anyway. Okay. Let me put it on the inside. Um. And I don't think you need to label everyone with the... Okay. Because once we know it's a two by two, we know. So right. Yeah. It might make things less confusing with all of the numbers in there. Different weird shape. Gotcha. Okay, so how many of those? So that's six. That's six. Yes. Okay. So and now we still need to make some. You need to use four little squares. Got to have four little squares in there somewhere. So and the four of them would fit the same area as one large square. Right? Yeah. So if we did like one, make those the little squares. Okay, good. 
There you and go. now you need to use a certain number of rectangles to complete what you've drawn so far to make a rectangle. Gotcha. Me. Okay. Now, if you if you complete this area, yes. is that going to make a rectangle? No, it makes a square. Okay. Here's well, an interesting question: Is a rectangle? Yeah, a square? I was going to say. Yeah. Is does it count? Remember geometry? It, it counts. Is a rectangle a square? Yes. Why? But because it has four. Wait, no. It has four sides. It has four sides. It has four. A square is a rectangle, but a rectangle is not a square. Because could be yes, That's right. So let's. What are the what are the criteria for a rectangle? That's a rectangle has four, has four sides, sides yes. and the opposite sides are the same. It has two of opposite, opposite sides parallel are the same. sides and the angles. Uh, ninety degrees 90 all degrees. the way around. Good. So those are what we need, right? So if you had a big gigantic square here, it would be a rectangle. It would be a rectangle. Yes, That's right. So if you want to make a square here, we could do that. We could also okay. take this little chunk here and move it over and here move it somewhere over there. if you want yeah. to. Right? Okay. And the ultimate question is, what is the ultimate question? How, how many little so ones do you need? First of all, we need to see how many of the little rectangles are you going to use. Okay. Then it asks, how many rectangles are needed to make a rectangular configuration? Explain how you know. Then the bonus part is, illustrate the different configurations that can be created. Wow. And how do you know you found all the possible <laughs> configurations? Okay. All right. Oh my goodness. Wow. Okay, well let's let's go with what you're doing. Okay. And then we'll we'll go from there. Maybe we need to change things up. So then So we want to fill that in, definitely. So those There are you here. go. And those are all one by two. We mm -hmm. have a big rectangle here. Yes. And so how many of those did you did you we use? We used four of we those. Four of those, right? Mm -hmm. So four and six and four. and four. Yes. Gotcha. So that's one configuration. So what I would do now is go, all right, you've used four rectangles and you made a configuration. Yes. Is there another way to use four rectangles and make a different configuration than what you just did? Oh, okay. So uh, is there another way to do it other than what you've already drawn, using right. four rectangles already? Right. Well, yeah, you could do it. You could do... Here you go. Switch pins. Okay. Okay, show me what you're going to do with this one. There's so one there that made one big square. We could keep these. Mm -hmm. You can just draw it right next to it. Yeah. There you yeah. Go. So if we keep those and... Oh, that's kind of... <laughs> That's all right. That's You're not good. great. So if we keep those, and those are all of our two by twos. Still, okay. I just kept this configuration. Uh -huh. Then we send. Let's see. If we put these the same, and then we send this one this way. Okay. This one down here, over here. Okay. And we keep this. Mm, no, we're running into problem because. I'm just going to have the random for two rectangles out here. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Let's see. So that is using the same number of rectangles, but that won't make a rectangle. No. Right. So that won't work. Correct. Right. So I say erase that one. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Okay. Erase so one thing I suggest is taking a look at it and what is the area of what you have drawn so far? Oh, uh -huh, there you go. Okay. So this length is six, and this length is also six, so the area is 36. And so the area of the new rectangle has to be 36, right? Yes. We don't have a choice about that. Correct. That's the key. Is that right? Yes. The area is so now, how did you make 36? Um, ah, right. What, what was the size of the rectangle to make 36? It was a six by six, correct? Yeah. Yes. So what think about the ways? factors, right? Nine, four. <laughs> All right, okay. So here we go. Let's draw this, right? Let's say that we have this one here, and this is four by nine. Yes. Can you figure out what shapes need to go where to make that four by nine sh shape? So then you would have three of the two by twos, right? And then you'd have one more row. Oh, so this wait. is only six, right? Yes, that's only six. Gotcha. Yes. Okay. Okay. So yeah. Let's see Where if we that? can get rid of some of these. Ooh. I let's like it, see. but you're gonna have four, so you're right there. Yeah. So it's gonna split in half. As far as that part, so we can split it in half. I'll give you that. And if okay. we do two, four, six, right? There's six of them there. Yes. Can you fit the rest of them in there? So here's our. Wait. So here's two. These are all twos. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then that's six. Then we need three. And you need that little edge, right? Yeah. So this is also two. This is your four yes. squares. 
Okay. Oh, so we've yeah, done yeah, this yeah. one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. We've taken care of those, but we got to figure out where the rest of those little rectangles go. Where do they go? So then you like flip it up this way. There's so that's two, the there's one. There's one of them here. Yes. Right? There's, and then there's one there's here. One here. And there's one there. Yes. Right? There's one there. And then where are the other two? Like this. There you go. So that's one way to do it. Now, what's another wow. way to make 36? It's a uh, great problem solving ability, right? Because again, there's not just one answer. Yeah. But we do have one strategy to use. Yes. What's another way to make 36? 36 times one, but wow, that Wow, that'd be tough. That's now, right, okay, so see, why wonderful wouldn't idea. that work? Yeah, exactly, that's what I was gonna ask. Yeah, why wouldn't that work? It would be, it you would don't be, have enough to go across all the way to 36. Oh no, because the width is two. There we go. The so we could two. make a whole bunch of these. Yeah. We could probably make a bunch of those. This one would have a hard time. Yeah. Yeah, we'd have to shave, shave the top off there. So we can't do 136, but we have six times six, and we have four times nine. What else? We have three times 12. Okay, three times 12. Anything else that we could do before uh, we even do it? Well, we have two times 18. Sure, two times 18. Um, I think that's it. So these are the other two that we need to be able to figure out how to yeah. do them, right? Yeah. Yes. Do you want to try to draw one of them? Sure. All right. I can do... That's 12, that's 3. Okay. Um, if we split it in half this way, here's our... S mm. <laughs> mm. I have to think. Okay, okay. So this is 2 by 2. Yeah. So we can't have these. So we can't split it in half. <laughs> Hang on. Wait, let me just... Okay. How about this? What if we take yes, this down exactly. here, right? And so then you'd have and to put the rectangles. And these are all ones and these yes. are all twos. Where do all the squares go? So the rectangles are down here, but the squares all have to go up here. Gotcha. Go ahead and fill in the squares in the top. How many of them will there be? So there has to be six. Six of them. Now is two times six 12? Mm, yes. It is. Nice. Yes. So go ahead and draw all six of them at the top there. Okay. That's, that's a good deal. One. Strange how that worked. Even if we didn't plan it, we'll take credit for it. Okay, those aren't exactly <laughs> even. Though they, even though they don't look like squares, they we're going to go They don't look like squares at all. <laughs> okay, so there's now a Now you've got six. seven up there. Yeah, that's oh, right. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, one, two, three, four, five, six. We're going to pretend those are squares. Okay. Okay, and then we need four rectangles. So, right? But they're only two wide. Yeah. So you're going to have one of them there. Remember, there's only one high. And two, and three, and four. There's Which the only gets us eight across. Yep. Yeah. So then from and then we eight, need four of those. we need to go. So then we just do four yep. squares. That's there it. One, two, three, four. It is possible. Yes. Wow. What's the last one? As two and times we're going to hold off on the last one right oh, now okay. for a quick minute. But that's a way to do it because when students see that problem, they think, all right, well, I'm going to use four rectangles. If you stick to four rectangles and you know the area is going to be 36, there are only a certain number of ways you can get an area of 36. So you know there is only four possible configurations to draw. Mm -hmm. And if you can draw those, then you can explain. I know I have found all the configurations because in order to get an area of 36, there are only these number of ways to do it, and right. you've illustrated them. Mm -hmm. right. Some students get caught up and they go, well, I can use two, I can use three, I can use four, I can use five, I can, and you can go on forever. Sure. And it would be a never-ending problem. That's right. So hopefully that helps out a lot of students that are working on that problem. And right now we do have one more opportunity to head back out to visit with Mary Lou and the folks at the Kern County Forensics Lab. And we are back at Kern Regional Crime Laboratory. Now, we were kind of looking at the evidence when you retrieve it in, correct? A little bit deeper look. Can you kind of tell us where we're at right now? Yes, we actually have a firing range uh, at the laboratory. So this is a one lane uh, indoor firing range. And down this range, we can shoot high power rifles or shotguns. We don't collect the bullets when we fire down here, but we do collect the cartridge cases or the shot shells. So we will fire down the range here. Uh, we then will collect the shot shell or, or the cartridge case from the firearm. And this is what we can use to either put into our database or to compare uh, on the comparison scope. So what else, besides here, where else do you use in this area to help you with the evidence? Well, when we need to collect a bullet, we actually have a water tank that we can test fire handguns, mostly handguns, into the water tank. And we, uh, that will actually collect, we can collect a bullet in pristine condition. Why water? Well, we use, what we do is we actually turn on the jets and that uh, decreases the water tension. It breaks up the water tension so it doesn't damage the bullet. Okay, can you show us the water tank? Yes. And we are here also with Allison Kennedy. Yes, hello. 
walk us through how you use this. So uh, here I have turned on the jets and a, a light inside of the tank. You can hear the water, it sounds like a, like a spa. Uh, and so this is the opening that we uh, test fire into uh, with, the, with the firearms. The cartridge cases usually uh, will be kicked out from a semi-auto. So how do you collect the bullet out of here? Okay, well first we turn off uh, the jets and we come over here and Allison has will help to secure the lid it's very heavy okay so as you can see here we then have to look for the bullets sometimes it's a little easier sometimes they hide behind this mat but we have one right there we can see the bullet it's actually a very large bullet so we can, Allison can, we have some putty on the end of this, uh, plumber's putty that we use on the end of this rod and we can retrieve the bullet. It's kind of a two man operation here, two person operation. And then you can see that uh, these bullets, are, this bullet is not damaged. Like oftentimes we get bullets from crime scenes that are damaged because they've hit an item or gone through an item. And so these, we can see some lands and grooves that have been imparted uh, from the firearm, from the barrel, inside the barrel. So this is good for uh, analysis and comparison. Very interesting. And Allison, can you kind of tell us what your position is here at the lab? I am a supervising criminalist here and I uh, help manage the firearms and tool marks unit as well as the crime scene response team. So if somebody was interested in becoming an analysis, um, what process would they need to do? Uh, well, the very minimum to become an examiner or analyst here at the laboratory is to have your Bachelor of Science degree in uh, science, um, whether that's chemistry, biology, or some other related science. And then Kelly talked about, again, that two-year process, correct? Is there another process to go through, some more training besides that? Uh, once an individual is hired, there's a training process depending on what unit they're assigned to. And for the firearms unit, it can be two to three years. Uh, other units in the laboratory, some are shorter, some are longer. The best examiners here at the laboratory are very much like Kelly, very detail-oriented very good at recording observations and obviously have a, a keen sense for science and, and math. So really focusing on those science classes. Yes. Well, ladies, again, thank you so much for letting us come to the lab. And again, just a little appreciation. Um, we always love coming here and visiting. And thank you again so oh. much for walking us through all the evidence and everything here. Thank you again. And that's it from the Kern Regional Crime Laboratory. Back to you, Mike. All right, thanks for that, Mary Lou, and thank you, everybody over there. We do have phone tutors available on Tuesdays and Wednesdays throughout most of the school year. Lauren, a senior at Stockdale High School, has been our guest this afternoon, has done some fantastic work today. And if, because you have done a lot of math now, you've gone through yeah. 12, 13 years of school yeah. and have done a lot of different math courses. Is there a bit of advice you would give to students that are finding math a bit more difficult or struggle with it right now? Mm -hmm. Um, there's lots of topics I find very difficult and I find that asking questions is very helpful. There's lots of peers in my classes who are just like, oh, I have no idea what we're doing and they just go home and struggle with it. That's not going to do anything. You're not just going to magically have it appear in your brain. Ask your teachers. They know what they're doing. That's why they're teaching you. And <laughs> they're the ones that can answer your questions, yeah, right? Exactly. So ask questions. I know a lot of times students are embarrassed to mm -hmm. ask questions. They don't want to look like they don't understand what they're doing. Yep. And that's why we tell students all of the time. Call, do the math. We will help you do it. Mm -hmm. We are the ones that know what you are getting to do. Mm -hmm. We are the ones that can help you and maybe just a different perspective on it will help you out also. Yep. You have a new job. Do you know what that is? What? An ambassador. Hold that new uniform up and hold it up over there. <laughs> so you are now an ambassador for Do The Math. So you can tell everybody about us, right? Yes, There definitely. you go. Did you learn a little something today? Definitely, Did yes. you have fun? I did. Good. Well, you know what? Until we meet again, continue to do the math. Major support for Do The Math has been provided by Chevron.
the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Edison International, Dolly Strong Credit Union, California Resources Corporation, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, Bakersfield City School District, and Kern High School District with additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California.